Hello, and welcome to chapter 2 of our Bible study on the Gospel of John. Now, before we begin, uh, I believe that uh, because context is very important when we study the Word of God, and what I mean by context is when we read anything in the Word of God, we have to understand, you know, what was said before that and what was said after that, you know. So I briefly want to summarize what we learned in chapter 1. We learned that Jesus Christ is the living Word of God. He is the living Word of God. He is the embodiment of God who sacrificed himself in human form so that our sins could be forgiven, that anyone that believes in him, his, their sins will be forgiven and they will have a ter- eternal life. And that uh, will be expounded upon later on in, uh, in the Gospel of John. Uh, we also learned about John the Baptist and who he was, and uh, also about how Jesus gathered some of his disciples. Uh, so now we're looking at chapter 2, and basically this passage of Scripture, uh, the first passage of Scripture in chapter 2 that we're going to look at is going to be verses 1 through 11. And it's basically describing Jesus' first miracle, which most people know is turning water into what? Grape juice? What? Uh, Tang? No, no. He turned water into wine. (laughs) And uh, so we're going to just listen to verses 1 through 11. And you can read it through on your own, and then we'll come back and break it down and discuss what it says. Chapter 2. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Praise God. His disciples believed on him. Amen. Let us just look at this passage of scripture and discuss what the word of God says. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Now Cana of Galilee was a town in the community where Jesus grew up. And the mother of Jesus was there. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there at the wedding and she had been invited and I'm sure she uh, invited Jesus and he was there with her and there to honor her because it was a one of the commandments was to honor thy father and mother, remember. And so Jesus was there, I'm sure, to honor his mom. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. Now, Jesus' mother says, They have no wine, Jesus. They're, They're out of wine. I know you can do something about this. I've seen you. I know there's there's special things about you. The Bible tells us that Mary, uh, from the time Jesus was a baby, knew that he was destined for great things and that he was to be the ch- uh, son of the Lord. And she was told that he, she was carrying the child of God. Amen. And 
in verse 5. His mother said to the servants, Whatsoever he says to you, do it. In other words, they, she said to the servants, whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. So that tells me something right there. Jesus had told her, mother, what have I to do? Or woman, what have I to do with this? I don't have anything to do with this. I mean, I don't care if they're out of wine. But yet his mom says to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. In other words, she knew that Jesus was going to do whatever she told him to do. Why? Because it says, honor thy father and mother. She knew that because she had asked him, he wasn't going to refuse her. Verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins of water apiece. In other words, now let me tell you what these were. What they're saying is there were some big stone pots of water that the Jews used to wash their feet. They lived in the desert. Israel was a very dry place. They lived in the desert. These were giant stone pots. And they were usually used for uh, washing their feet. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bring that to the governor of the feast. And they brought it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was. In other words, he didn't know where it had come from. He just knew it was good wine. It tasted like wine to him. He didn't realize it had been water. But the servants that drew the water knew. In other words, the servants knew. They were like, man, we put water in these old dirty foot washing pots and he just made it into wine. We saw it right with our own eyes. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man at the beginning does set out good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So basically what's happened here is Jesus tells the servants to fill up these nasty old little water pots full of that had been used for uh, washing their feet. And he says, fill them up with water. He turns that water into what? He turns it into wine. I want to say something about this. Jesus would not have turned that water into wine if he thought there was a sin to do it. If he thought it was an unrighteous act, he would not have done it. Now, am I saying that he condoned excessive drinking? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I am simply saying that he never meant that drinking was an evil. Excessive drinking, sure. But to have a drink or to have some wine, it was the custom in those days to drink wine. And he didn't see anything wrong with that. Otherwise, he would not have done the miracle, amen? He's not going to do unrighteousness. He's God. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. And so we see several things from the... Uh, miracle that he did. First of all, we see that he obeyed what he was taught in the law. He obeyed his mother. He showed obedience to authority, being in this case parental authority. And we also see that he 
has done this first miracle and people are beginning to see, oh, hey, wait, wait a minute, what's this? Who is this man that's doing these things? And the Bible says that his disciples who saw these things believed on him. They witnessed it. They had a testimony to it. They saw it. You know, when you know what you know, when you know, when you've seen it, you've experienced it, you're convinced because you know it's real. They believed on Jesus because of this miracle that they saw him perform in his own hometown community. Praise God. Now we'll take the next passage of scripture, which will be uh, from verse 12 down to the end of the chapter. See, this is a very short chapter. Uh, through verse 25. So this is going to be John 12 through 25 of chapter 2. John chapter 2, verses 12 through 25. Read it on your own, listen to the audio, and we'll come back and break it down and discuss what the Bible says about this passage of Scripture. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name, when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. For he knew what was in man. Hallelujah. Hmm. Praise God. Let us just examine now what God says in this passage of Scripture. After this, he went down into Capernaum. He and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there many days. Now, Capernaum was a town that it was also in his community, so it was another town in that area. He and his mother and his brethren, uh, his family, and his disciples went down into Capernaum. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, which was a feast that they celebrated, which is about the time when we celebrate Easter right around that area. Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. In other words, he saw people who were selling and buying and changing money and the temple had basically become a marketplace. And uh, Jesus was not pleased. In verse 15 it says, And when he had made a scourge, which is basically a whip, of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. And the sheep and the oxen and, the, and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. In other words, he went in there, he made a whip out of cords, and he flipped over the tables. He said, you get out of my father's house. He said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence. Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. In other words, get this stuff out of here. 
Take this stuff out and get get rid of all this crap. This isn't what going to church is all about. This is supposed to be the temple of God. This is supposed to be a sanctuary. And you've turned it into a marketplace. You're selling animals for sacrifice. You're selling this. You're selling that. You've made it all about the money. The church has become all about the money. I'm going to shut up. Verse 17. And his disciples remembered that it was written... The zeal of my father's house hath eaten me up. The zeal of my father's house has eaten me up. That was a scripture in the Old Testament. He said, the zeal of my father's house. If you have a zeal for something, it means that you have a passion for it. You are, if you're zealous, you're more than passion. You're willing to defend it. You're willing to die for it. You're committed to it, sold to it 100%. You have a zeal for it. The zeal of my father's house has eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said to him, What sign showest thou unto us? seeing that thou doest these things. In other words, what sign are you going to give us that shows us that you have the right to do these things? Show us a sign that you've got the right to, you know, you come into the, the temple, you come into our church, a place where we've spent lots of money. It took us all kinds of time to build this and it's lavishly constructed. You come in, you overturn the tables, you drive out the people who are doing what we're telling them to do. You're telling them they're wrong. What authority do you have to do this? Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. They said, then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? It took us 46 years to build this temple. Are you going to raise it up in, in three days if we destroy it? Verse 21 says, but he spoke of the temple of his body. I got to say that again. But he spoke of the temple of his body. That's verse 21. Jesus wasn't talking about the building. He was making an example. He was using that building as an example. You know, preachers often make examples in their messages, and they often use examples. I heard a message T.D. Jakes preached the other day about an eagle and the, the nest that the eagle builds and how she gets the chicks to leave the nest. And he wasn't talking about eagles, and he wasn't talking about nests, but he used that as an example. And Jesus here is using the temple as an example, but he was talking about the temple of his body because our bodies, his body, because he was God in what form? Human form. His body is the temple. Our bodies are the temple of the living God. Amen. Wow. That's, that's a a heavy concept. And I like what it says here in verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. In other words, when the, when the disciples saw this, when they realized what had happened, when they remembered what Jesus said, he said, you know what? He told those the the leaders of the Jewish church, he said, you destroy me, you destroy this temple, the temple of my body, and I will build it back up again in three days. And Jesus rose on the third day and they witnessed it. They saw this happen. And this just affirmed their faith. This made them really believe and sell out. They were sold out to Jesus Christ and to the gospel. Verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man. 
In other words, he didn't tell any of those people that he came to who he was or reveal himself to those people because he knew their hearts. He knew what was in their hearts. He knew they weren't going to seek truth. He knew they were only there after miracles. He knew they were only there after a sign, after something. You see, God knows our hearts. God created all mankind. He knew who we were before he put us into play. And you may say, well, if he already knew I was going to misbehave, why would I, why do I have to, to serve him? He wants willing servants. He doesn't want slaves. If you're not a willing servant of God, then you're a slave to the devil. If you're not willing to serve God, then you're a slave to your master, the devil. He didn't need anyone to testify of him because it had already been done and it was going to be done even more. And he wasn't going to reveal himself to hypocrisy. As I've said before, God hates hypocrisy. It's one thing God just cannot stand is hypocrisy. And so some of the folks that he came to in his ministry he revealed to them who he was and it was revealed to them you know in scripture later on it says no man comes to the father but by me i can't come to god unless god puts it in my heart to do so and he's only going to put it in my heart to do so if i have an honest and, and a humble spirit that is going to seek him and let him be the master of my life he's got to be the master of my life because if he's not my life is nothing but confusion if he's not the complete master of my life then my life is chaos. And so he's only going to reveal himself to me if I'm willing to allow him to control it. And that's, that's, that's sometimes hard to do, to allow someone else to control us, or to control, to give up control, amen? So basically, what have we seen here in chapter 2? In chapter 2, we have seen Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine. And he didn't see anything wrong with doing that. He did it out of obedience to his mother. He did it as a demonstration of his power. He did it to show people that he was God. He did it to get people talking about who he was. His disciples believed on him when they saw those things. Amen.